Why do so many Christians talk about the mark of the beast? What is it and what's the big deal about it? I will explain this big controversial topic to you in a simple way in under 15 minutes. You may have heard about the term the mark of the beast. It's one of those topics that even if you're not a Christian, you might have heard about it. And there's a lot of theories about what it may be. People talk about RFID chips or tattoos or vaccines. And trust me, as having a Christian YouTube channel, I've seen some of the craziest ideas come by in the comment section. The verses that talk about this mark of the beast, they are found in the last book of the Bible called Revelation, which means a revealing of something. And the first verse in that book tells us that this is the revelation of Jesus. So this is something that Jesus himself wants to reveal to us. So was it Jesus's intention to say something that would be so vague that throughout the centuries people would keep changing their minds and keep finding new theories about what this mark of the beast is, you know, leaving a lot of people scared and confused, not even to mention all the ways that these false ideas have damaged the reputation of the Bible in the eyes of the world? No. This was, of course, never Jesus' his intention. What Jesus revealed to us should be clear. The problem is many Christians don't look at the context in which this Mark of the Beast scenario plays out. So before we get into these specifics, I want you to see that context first. At the time when this Mark of the Beast is enforced, the entire population is divided into two camps. The Bible says, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So two groups, one that is apparently so large that it's described as pretty much all people on earth, and then there's this much, much smaller group that has their name written in the book of life. And what is it that distinguishes these two groups? Well, there was one word that kept coming back in these verses, that is worship. The vast majority of the world will worship this beast and the dragon, while only a small group of people will worship Jesus. The lamb. That is what this whole end time scenario is about. It's about who you worship. In another place, the Bible says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This end-time power, also known as the Antichrist, is seeking this exalted position even over God, over anything else that is worshipped. It's after this position where it receives all worship, where people obey and submit to it as their superior. And that's exactly how this whole war between good and evil started in the first place. It started in heaven with the angel Lucifer, who now is known as the devil, who was seeking the very same thing. About him the Bible says, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That sounds very similar to this earthly end time power, doesn't it? Seeking this exalted position. This is because the Bible says about this earthly beast power that the dragon, which represents the devil when working through secular powers, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The mastermind behind this earthly beast power is none other than the devil himself. In other words, he's using this earthly power to get what he's been after all along to receive that worship that belongs to God. So when we talk about this beast power, we're really talking about an earthly system that the devil is using to get our worship, to get us to submit to him rather than to God. That is the context in which we are introduced to the topic of the video. The Bible says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. These are the verses that have captured the attention of many Christians. But something else is happening at the same time, which is actually much more important, but not many people know about it. Here, have a look. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, 
having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. God will seal his people. So we have two similar things happening. The beast is enforcing a mark, while God seals his people. What is this all about? Now remember, how many sides will there be in the end time? Two, you have those who worship God and those who worship the beast and the dragon. So what the mark and the seal do, it's very simple. They are the expressions that show on what side you are. The devil enforces a mark claiming, these are my people. They belong to me. They worship. They have submitted to me. And God is doing the same thing with the seal. He is saying, these are my people. They worship me. They have chosen my side. But notice the difference between when they claim that you are on their side. Do you remember where the mark of the beast is placed? The forehead and the hand, right? What about God's seal? Just the forehead. Very interesting. Hey, but what does that mean? Well, the forehead represents your beliefs, your convictions, your character. It's who you are. The hand, on the other hand, represents your actions. It's what you do. This means that the devil will mark you as his if you are like him in your beliefs and your character, or if you simply comply to his ideology in your actions without necessarily supporting it. And you might wonder, why would someone do that if they don't support it? Well, that's because there's going to be consequences if you don't go along with the plans of the beast. You'll be an outcast in society because the vast majority of the world will choose the side of the beast. You will not be allowed to buy or sell. And at some point, there will even come a death decree against those who refuse this mark of the beast. That's a lot of pressure. See, the devil doesn't care about how he gets people to his side and away from God's side, whether it's by convincing your beliefs or simply forcing and deceiving you. He just wants to rule over you and have you submit to him at any cost. God, however, he doesn't roll like that. God doesn't want you to do anything that goes against your free will or your convictions, which is why you cannot get the seal in your hands. God is after genuine worship that is motivated by trust and love for him. Because for him, it's all about relationships. It's not about exercising power and control. It's about you wanting to adopt his ways as your own because you believe it's right. It's about you wanting to be like him in character because that's the kind of person that you want to be. When God sees your desire for your heart and his heart to be in tune, he will make the claim, this person is part of my family and he will seal you and you will be saved. We cannot be saved by our actions. Our part is to want to be on his side, to believe by faith that he will do that transformative work in us, that we can become more like him. And in Jesus' last campaign message to the world to choose to elect him as the one that we worship, he reminds us of the ultimate way in which we are to express this faith. It says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now it's very interesting that Jesus is actually quoting from one of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament and for a very significant reason. Have a look. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Now why is it that Jesus draws our attention to the Sabbath? It's because this is the day that God had set apart, all the way back in creation, for worship. We have made a separate video on this topic, so if this is new for you, I can recommend that you watch that one. On the Sabbath day, we are to rest from our works, and instead we focus on God's work. We acknowledge by faith that He is our Creator. He is our Savior and Recreator. The one who, through the Holy Spirit, makes us more like Him. And it's no coincidence that in this Sabbath commandment, we actually find all three elements that are normally found in a royal seal. Much like a signature that you would end a work email with. You have the name, the title, and the territory. For example, Melvin Sandelin, founder, The Christian Life.
And in the Sabbath commandment, we find the Lord your God, which is the name he made. This is his title for the creator, the heavens and the earth, his territory. So keeping the Sabbath, God's holy day for worship, is that ultimate demonstrative expression that we submit to him and we worship him. And the devil, he knows that. Which is why it's no surprise that one of the descriptions of this earthly beast power that he's using is that he shall intend to change times and law. What better way to steal away the worship that belongs to God than to create a false copy, a counterfeit of God's true day of worship. To change this Sabbath commandment in such a way that it's no longer this ultimate sign of faith in God's work, but instead a sign of rebellion and exalting ourselves as the created beings over the creator God. And this, friends, this beast power has done exactly that. In our previous video of this series, we identified this beast power as the Roman Catholic Church. We've looked at almost 20 characteristics from the Bible, and they are the only one that literally fits every single description. And notice what they themselves say about this Sabbath day of worship. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scripture should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep the Saturday holy. In another quote they say, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act, so talking about the change from Saturday to Sunday, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power. The Catholic Church, this earthly beast power, indeed claimed to have changed God's holy day of worship from Saturday to Sunday, the Sunday which was and is the pagan day of worship. And they admitted that this isn't biblical. This change was based on their own sense of power, that they could change God's law to be above the scriptures. They say it themselves, Sunday worship is the mark of the creation rebelling against the creator. Two days of worship. You have the true Bible Sabbath, the Saturday, and the false counterfeit Sabbath, Sunday. One marking that you worship God, you submit to Him, and you rest from your works, and you put your full trust and faith in His work. And the other day, marking that you worship the beast. You obey the teachings and the traditions of man, submitting to the rebellious powers that are opposing God's commandment. And in the end time, these two days of worship will become those visible expressions of whose side you are on. It's the external sign of your inner choice that you choose to worship one over the other. And Bible prophecy tells us that history, it will repeat itself. That the Catholic Church will once again come into that same power like it had during the Dark Ages. And through secular law, they will force people to keep the Sunday and forbid the keeping of the Saturday. Just like they have done before. And that is the mark of the beast. Submitting to that law when it comes, that is to exalt this beast power, the dragon over God. You know, whether you believe the lies and you agree with Sunday sacredness and your convictions, or if you don't necessarily believe it, but you go along with it in your actions because of tradition or pressure, it means that you are choosing the side of the devil. And this marks that you have chosen to give your worship to them and not God. But friends, even though now Sunday worship, it is not yet the mark of the beast because it isn't enforced through law, it is already against God's commandments. Sunday, it is not the day of worship that God has set aside. It is the false day of worship that God's enemy has instituted. As Bible-believing Christians, you know, we love God. We, of course, we already now want to do what is right. We don't just want to wait until we need to choose and force and blah, blah, blah. We already now want to follow his commandments, right? That is why I decided to leave the Sunday keeping church that I attended. And instead, I joined a church that keeps the Bible Sabbath. In our next video in the series, we will talk more about how this mark of the beast will be enforced. And it probably doesn't come as a surprise to you, but it will get help from another world power. One that we're probably all familiar with. I'll see you there, Maranatha.